على رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اما بعد اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن احسن قولا ممن دعا الى الله وعمل ومن احسن قولا ممن دعا الى الله وعمل صالحا وقال انني من المسلمين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي I welcome all the viewers of the Peace TV network the Peace TV English the Peace TV Urdu the Peace TV Bangla and the Peace TV Chinese as well as my four social media platforms which are the Facebook the YouTube the Instagram and Twitter I welcome all the viewers with Islamic greetings assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh may peace mercy and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. I welcome you to this program. Ask Dr. Zakir, season four, session four. Here, you're most welcome to ask any questions on Islam and comparative religion or any question which a non-Muslim have asked you and you are unable to reply. Any question that you find in the media which, which is attacking Islam or you'd like any clarification, this is your opportunity. You can ask your question on any of my social on any of my four social media platforms, but the best would be to ask as a WhatsApp message. You can text your message, your question in brief, mentioning your name your profession, the city and country of origin to the WhatsApp number plus six zero double one two one double three double three six zero. I repeat plus six zero double one two one double three double three six zero. Before we throw the floor open, I would like to give two short messages. Number one, I would like to inform the viewers that the WhatsApp number has changed because we changed it to a better number so that people can remember it. The new WhatsApp number, as you know that I'm in Malaysia and the Malaysia code is 60. So the WhatsApp number starts with plus 60. And even the ending two digits are the same, 60. The in between eight digits are either remember one to three. It's double one, two one, double three, double three. So the new WhatsApp number for texting your messages plus six zero double one two one double three double three six zero this is much more easier to remember than the past number all those who have texted the questions on the old number yet will receive it i'll be inshallah keeping the old number on for another two weeks so for two weeks both the mobiles will be on but in future, inshallah, it is preferable that you text on the new number. And I would like to repeat, the new number where you can mention your question is plus six zero double one two one double three double three six zero. The second message is that Alhamdulillah, since the last few days, we have even upgraded our Peach TV Chinese to high definition. So now, mashallah, all the four satellite channels on the Peace TV network are high definition. Peace TV English has also become HD. Peace TV Urdu is also HD. Peace TV Bangla is also HD, as well as Peace TV Chinese. All these four channels are on Intelsat 20, on frequency one, on frequency four, one, four nine point five, and. As I mentioned last time, we have also started our telecast, Peace TV English HD and Peace TV Urdu HD on the PakSat, on Pakistan satellite. And it's also there on the Arab Sat Badr 4. Now we will start with the question of the session. The first question on the WhatsApp is Assalamu alaikum, sir. 
I am Muhammad Saqib Rashid, a third year MBBS student from Silhet, Bangladesh. A question is troubling me for many days. The question is related to Dawa activity. If I myself am not doing a certain make amal or virtuous deed such as tahajjud prayer, etc., can I give Dawa to others about that virtuous deed which I myself am not performing? Again, if I myself is already doing a sinful act, is it right for me to forbid someone else from doing that same sinful act? Somebody is, can I do Dawa when I myself am not properly following all principles of the Sharia? Or should I have to be 100% rectified and only then I will have the right to do Dawa? Sir, I am badly in need of your valuable advice. I really admire you. May Allah grant you hayat e tayyibah. Please visit Bangladesh soon. We love you. We, we will love to have you among us. Respect from Bangladesh. I love you too. Brother Muhammad Saqib has asked a question that do we have to be 100% perfect in following the Sharia and should not do any mistakes and not do any sin before we start doing Dawah? And secondly, that if we do certain sinful act, can we prohibit others from not doing it? Or if we are not doing some good deed, can we ask others to do that good deed? Let me tell you at the outset that no human being can follow 100% perfect Sharia and not do anything. That is only the prophets. Only the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are sinful. Today in the world, no one can claim that it's 100% perfect. He's following the Sharia 100%. He's not doing any sin, not even a small sin, because it is human to her. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari. A Prophet said, Balligo anni wala aya. Propagate even if you know one verse. Even if you know one verse about Islam, as long as you know it correctly, it is your duty to propagate. So it is not compulsory that you should be a 100% perfect Muslim following 100% Sharia before you start doing Dawah. And normally, when we do Dawah, Alhamdulillah, the more Dawah activities you do, the more your Iman increases and more your practice increases. Regarding your question, that can you ask someone to do any virtuous deed if you yourself are not doing that deed? For example, Taj Salah. As far as asking others to do a virtuous deed which you are not doing, Allah says in the Glorious Quran, in Surah Saf, chapter number 61, verse number 2, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amun, O you who believe, Lima taakuluna, Ma la tafalu, Do not say what you do not do. So according to Surah Saf, chapter number 61, verse number 2, you should not say things which you do not do. So, but natural, you cannot give a talk. If you're not offering tajud, you cannot give a talk on saying tajud is very important. And then there are ways how you, you cannot miss tajud. And you keep an alarm and you give all the details of how not to miss tajud and how to offer tajud when you yourself are not praying tajud, giving the impression that you are very strict in tajud. This would be wrong. But generally, while saying that you should offer salah, you should follow sunnah, that you should that you should offer sunnah the mokada as much as possible, offer tajud. By the by, no problem. Or if someone asks you a question that should you offer tajud, then you can say, our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that the most important salah after the first salah is Qiyamul Layl. That is the witr and also the touch. And then you can talk about the importance and then say towards the end of the answer that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make you and me very particular in offering tajjud salah. Or may he give us a daya that we get up for tajjud and offer it regularly. So in this way, while you are saying that may Allah give hidayah to you and me so that we offer tajjud regularly, it 
is accepted. But you cannot give a false impression to the people that you are very particular in Tajud and give a lecture on Tajud and you are not offering yourself. But generally giving advice about the things which are virtuous when you yourself are not doing is permitted generally. But always it's important in the ending you can ask Allah to say that me, he, let you and me do this good act. So you are covering it up. Or for example, if you are doing a haram activity like smoking, you cannot give a lecture on the ill effects of smoking and how can you prevent yourself from smoking and if you are smoking then how can you see to it that you stop smoking when you yourself are smoking. It will give a false impression to the people. But if someone asks you, is smoking prohibited? You can very well say that Quran says in Surah Bakhara, chapter number 2, verse number 185, that do not make your own hands the cause of your own destruction and then give the reason why smoking is prohibited according to the World Health Organization. Every year 6 million people die of smoking. It's nothing but a kind of suicide, etc, etc. And then say in the ending that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help those people who are addicted to the smoking and may see to it that he keep us away from the smoking. So in this way, if you end your answer, I feel it is permitted. But giving a false impression that you are not smoking and giving a lecture on how to stop your smoking, how to de-addict yourself, this would be giving a false impression and would be going again the verse of the Quran of Surah Saf, chapter number 61, verse number 2, we says that do not say what you do not do. But generally, for a dai, yes, he can talk about the virtuous thing that people should do and stay away from the acts which are wrong. One thing very important is that when you start doing dawa, but natural, you have to only give dawa about those things which you know very well. And number two, but natural, those things which you are doing. While you give dawa, we find that your iman keeps on increasing and your practice of your deen keeps on increasing. For example, a dai may be offering five times salah, but he may not be very particular in his sunnat e or sunnat e Now while he started doing dawah and the more he started doing dawah, Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increases the iman and increases his amal also. And we find that the moment you start doing dawah, more and more, Alhamdulillah, iman increases and even your amal increases. Then you start seeing to it that a particular, even in sunnat e then you see that you start particular even in sunnat e ghair then you may be fasting the farad, uh, you may be fasting in the month of Ramadan, but then you start becoming more practicing, even your Shabbat fast, even Arafa, even the fasting of the Zilajjah, the first nine days, and even on the Ayyamul Beat, and your Amal keeps on increasing. So, but natural, you don't have to wait till you become a perfect 100% Muslim. But one thing is very important. That for a dai, his amal should be good and his akhlaq should be good. Imagine a dai if he is bad mouthed and if he is foul in his language, if his amal are not good, he will not be a good example. People will not listen to him. And imagine a person who keeps on insulting other people and shouting, but naturally he will not be effective because people always look up to a dai. So it's very important that the virtue of the dai should be as high as possible. So if you are doing dawa, Allah helps you and your iman increases and your virtuous deeds also keep on increasing. But you have to see to it and be particular that because you are calling people towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have to set a good example. So as far as possible, see to it that you are kind to the people, you are soft-spoken, you are humble to them, you keep on helping the others, so that besides speaking and giving the message of Islam with your tongue, you should also be a good example and a good Muslim, helping others, being kind to others, being loving to others, being merciful to others, and seeing to it that you solve people's problem, being kind-hearted. All these qualities, try and emulate the Prophet as much as possible. A dai is a person who is an ambassador of Islam and he should be a good example.
But again, it's not compulsory that you should be a hundred percent pakka musalman before you start doing dawah. Even as long as you're doing the faraid, you start doing dawah. And I know that I had an acquaintance who was involved in major sin. He even used to have alcohol. But he had many Christian friends. And he was very active in dawah. Though he was doing a major sin, but that doesn't mean I would go and tell him, you're having alcohol, so stop doing dawah. Alcohol is a major sin. But Alhamdulillah, the more you start doing dawah, Inshallah, Allah helps you to stay away from the major sins and the minor sins and gets you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So my advice to you would be, brother, that you start doing dawah, don't wait till you become a perfect Muslim, but see to it that you try and follow besides the faraid as much as the sunnah as possible. First the sunnah moqada. Then you can follow the sunnah of moqada. Even staying away from the major sins, then from the medium sins, then from the minor sins, as much as possible. But no human being can be perfect. Hope that's your question. The next question. I am Rizwan, 23 years old, from Kerala, India. I am a student and I am studying to become an Islamic scholar. I want to become a great Islamic dai like you. My doubt is, is it fair to put those who commit shirk in hell forever? It could be said that there is no problem even for a millennials. But how can that be fair when Allah says forever? Many non-Muslims have this doubt. This doubt pushes them from accepting Islam. As a Dai, how can you explain this to them? Please, please, please explain on the YouTube. The question posed by Brother Rizwan that when Allah SWT says in the glorious Quran that anyone who does shirk and dies as a mushrik he will be in hellfire forever abadan so isn't it illogical, isn't it unfair if you want to punish someone you can punish him for hundred years, million years, even a billion years but forever will this not push away the non-muslim from accepting Islam Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, Allah says in Surah Mulk, chapter number 67, verse number 2, Alladhi, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, huwa alladhi khalaq al mawta wal hayata. It is Allah who has created death and life to test which of you is good indeed. This life is a test for the hereafter. This life is a test for the hereafter. And in an examination, but natural, there are rules and regulations, and there is passing and failing the examination. For you to understand better, I'll give you an example that if a teacher sets a paper and teaches the class for the full year, the teacher tells that which chapters in the subject in the book are more important, which is less important, which is compulsory. And the teacher may say that this chapter is very important. And from this chapter, minimum so many questions will compulsory come. And this will carry more marks as compared to others. A student may or may not agree with the teacher. But the teacher knows the subject. If a student who is really clever and who comes out first in the class, he is more likely to agree with the teacher in the marking system than a student who gets an average mark or who fails. Because the student who is more studious and clever, he knows the subject better than the other students and will agree with the marking system of the teacher. As far 
as the punishment is concerned, which you say that non-Muslim will disagree with the statement given in the Quran that if you do shirk, you'll be in hell forever. First, let us try and understand the smaller sins, smaller than shirk. For example, according to Islam, if a person does zina, does adultery, the punishment given in the hadith is stoning to death. If you read the Bible, even in the Bible, the punishment for adultery, it is stoning to death. Now, today if we see, according to statistics, more than 90% in the Western countries, whether it be USA, whether it be UK, before they finish the university, they are involved in adultery. They are involved in zina, maybe fornication, others may be adultery. Now, when we ask these non-Muslims that the punishment for adultery is turning to death, 99.9% .9 of the Westerners, they will not agree. 99.9% .9 of the non-Muslims who live in the Western countries, they will disagree with the punishment because for them, adultery is common. It's a way of life. Fornication is common. It's a way of life. But to a Muslim who is a practicing Muslim, who knows the Sharia well, for him, he will agree that the punishment for adultery should be death. And that's what is even given in the Bible. So what we understand that because the Muslims understand the relationship of marriage and the importance of modesty, they will agree with the punishment. A non-Muslim who does not understand this concept for him, this punishment of stoning to death will be absurd. So that is the reason to understand the punishment, you have to understand the seriousness of the act. For example, if a person does treason against a country or he sells the secrets of the army, the secrets of the defense system to a country which is an enemy country but natural, the punishment for most of the countries would either be death penalty or it would be imprisonment for life. For example, if a person who is a terrorist and he kills 100 people, innocent people, what would be the punishment? In most of the country, it will either be death penalty or it would be if death penalty is not allowed in that country, it would be imprisonment for life, maybe 100 years, 200 years. So you going and telling to the judge that just because he killed 100 innocent people, why are you putting him in life forever? Put him for 5 years, for 10 years, why forever? This is the law of the country. Because we understand that he has killed 100 innocent people. So the punishment should be the most severe possible, either death penalty or imprisonment for life. So similarly, shirk is the biggest sin in Islam. It is number one major sin in Islam. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nisa, verse number 48, and Surah Nisa, verse number 116, that Allah, if he pleases, he will forgive anything. But the sin of shirk, he will never forgive. That means if a person does shirk and if he dies as a mushrik, Allah will never forgive him. If he does shirk and if he repents and he truly repents and stops it and then worships Allah, then Allah will surely forgive him. But if he dies as a mushrik while doing shirk, it is the biggest sin which Allah will never forgive. Now, to understand this concept, you will only understand if you know about the qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only if you know the concept of Tawheed will you understand how heinous is the crime of shirk. If you don't understand Tawheed, if you don't understand the concept of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will not be able to understand the punishment of shirk. Like how a Muslim will agree, who is a practicing Muslim, that that for adultery the punishment should be death. Similarly, a Muslim who knows the qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who knows the value of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who knows Tawheed, he will agree that the punishment should be the most severe. Because a non-Muslim, he doesn't realize the qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Rahman, 
and Rahim. He is not only giving us the health, the food, the clothing, the house, even the water we drink, it is free from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even the air we breathe, water if we don't get for few weeks, we will die. Air if we don't get for maybe half an hour or one hour, we will die. Imagine all this is free, the niyama. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is giving all this free, you go and worship somebody else. You can only understand if you know the qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let me give you another example. Our beloved Prophet said that anyone who offers two rakat of the sunnah salah before fajr, it is more valuable than the earth and the wealth in it. Imagine if you truly know the value of the salah and truly know the benefits of salah and the reward of salah, then only will you understand about this hadith. Otherwise, who will agree with that? Imagine sunnah salah, not the far salah. Sunnah salah which is not even a fard. The two rakah sunnah before the fajr salah, our beloved prophet said, is more valuable than the world and the wealth in it. Now, I am asking a simple question. That if there is a poor Muslim and if someone calls him urgently for something and says that, okay, fine, if you come, you'll make a thousand dollars very easily. And while doing that, if he has to miss his sunnah salah of the sunnah salah before the fajr salah, and if he goes, of course he'll go. Thousand dollars? He earned just, you know, in the poor countries like Bangladesh or India or Pakistan, the average earning is very little. Just a hundred dollars or a little bit more the average earning. Imagine a poor man, if someone says he's going to get a thousand dollars, he would surely not mind missing the Fajr Salah. Some people will give ten thousand dollars he'll miss. Because it is Sunnah Salah before the Fajr Salah. It's not Fard in Islam. But a person who knows the value and depending upon his requirement. For example, other people may not miss. For example, if someone offers me a hundred thousand dollars and says that while you come the UMF to you will miss your Sunnah Salah Fajr, I will not even miss my Sunnah Salah for a hundred thousand dollars. Though logically, praying Sunnah is not a farz. But on the other hand, if someone tells me that there is an important meeting, and you may not be able to offer your sunnah salah, but you will get a billion dollar, a billion dollar donation. Then I will think, a billion dollar? Okay, I will offer my fajr salah. Because that's a farz. With a billion dollar, what can I do? I can keep that money in waqf. I can add, do so much of dawah. Even I, if someone is giving a billion dollars and Sharia says, let a small loss take place to prevent a big loss, okay, I'm getting a billion dollars. Praying the Sunnah Salah before the Fajr Salah, it is not Farz. I'm not doing a sin. Okay, every day, now once in a year if I miss, what is the problem? Even I would go for that meeting if someone is giving donation and take it and invest in Dawah, not for myself. This is depending upon your understanding. Depend upon each one how does he understand. But our beloved Prophet said that the two rakah sunnah before the Fajr Salah is more important than the world and the wealth in it. In terms of money, it would be not trillions of dollars, it would be zillions of dollars. It's uncountable, the wealth in the world. And what does the Quran say? Quran says that on the day of judgment, these unbelievers who have failed the test will be put in the hellfire. They will never object to the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Because at that time, it would be crystal clear what is the value of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what is good, what is bad. So that time, they will understand. No kafir, no unbeliever will ever object to the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No kafir who has even been put in hell will ever object to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He will only say that give me one more chance and Allah says too late. So here on the day of judgment we will understand what is the real value of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And at that time it is mentioned in Quran in many places that the kafir they would not mind giving the full world if they own the wealth in the world, they would not mind bartering it for Jannah. So here we realize that if they were offering Salah, but natural, they would have believed in Allah, they wouldn't have done shirk. So here Allah says that on the day of judgment, even if they had the full world as a wealth, they would not mind exchanging for being away from hellfire and entering Jannah. Here our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that towards the end of the world, as the time passes, towards the end of the world, our Prophet said that one sajda, only one sajda, one prostration in the salah would be more valuable than the world and the wealth in it. Now it is two rakah sunnah. In two rakah sunnah, before the fajr salah, there are four sajda. Towards the end of time, the salah would be more valuable. One sajda alone would be more valuable than the world and the wealth in it. Because at that time, the value of wealth would be nothing. People, wealth would be in abundance. But main thing would be the iman. So you are coming back to your question. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the maximum punishment for the biggest sin. And the biggest sin is shirk. And only a person who understands the value of Tawheed and the value of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will realize that the punishment for a person who does shirk and dies as a mushrik should be held forever. For the Muslims, we may be very sinful, we may be doing all the sins, but as long as we don't do shirk, as long as we believe in Allah and the last and final messenger, we may do all the other sins, yet we may be in help fire for 100 years, 1000 years, million years, billion years. But finally, we will inshallah be put into Jannah. Because we don't do shit. And because we believe in Allah and his messenger. And Allah clearly says in the Quran that anyone who doesn't believe in Allah and his messenger will be in help fire forever. Here again, because if you say, okay, we will put the mushrik in the hellfire for 10 billion years. After 10 million years, the life hereafter is eternal. So the balance time will be in Jannah. It will be logical. So that's the reason logically it has to be that the biggest sin, if you are associating partners with your creator, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the punishment should be hellfire forever. Coming to your last part of the question, that this will put off a non-Muslim. I am sorry. You are not experienced in the field of Dawah. In fact, this is one of the reasons, one of the main reasons that will get the non-Muslims close to Islam. Among the various reasons that non-Muslims accept Islam, number one is Tawhid. And when they read this verse of the Quran, and when they realize how beautiful Islam is, they accept Islam. Now the example that I gave you earlier, that more than 90% of the non-Muslims living in the non-Muslim countries, they are involved in Zena before they pass the university. But imagine those Westerners who read Islam and when they accept Islam, two-thirds of which are ladies, what do they do? They start wearing hijab. They are more modest because these are the same Westerners 
who were involved in the same activities like a normal Westerner, but when they accept Islam, what do they do? They become more pious than average Muslim. They do hijab. They see to it that they are away from zina. They see to it that they are very pious. So similarly, when a non-Muslim reads the Quran, and when he understands the concept of Tawheed, he accepts Islam. When he reads the verse of the Quran, that if you do shirk, you will be in hellfire forever, there are more chances he will accept Islam, rather than the verse not be. If this verse wasn't there, yet, non-Muslim would accept Islam, but the major portion of the non-Muslims, the major percentage of non-Muslims who accept Islam is because of Tawheed. And one of the reasons is that they don't want to enter the hellfire and they want to be away from the hellfire. So this was according to me what Allah mentioned in the Quran that if you die as a mushrik you will be in hell forever. Abadan is perfectly correct. It is the most logical and one of the strong points for non-Muslim to accept Islam. Hope that's it. We have on the YouTube Sadiq Rahman, Muhammad Rabbul Hussein, Amir, Muhammad Motasim, Ravi Shah, Love from Kashmir, Muhammad Asim, Assalamu Alaikum, Wa Alaikum Salam, Abdo Adil Shah, Samina Bhaturuddin, Najrul Islam, Assalamu Alaikum, Wa Alaikum Salam, Khalil Ahmad Jatoi, Mani Ruzama, Rahman Sheikh, Rintu Sheikh, Umam Khan, Rustam Khan Taraki, Salam, love you, sir, I love you too, from Afghanistan. Muhammad Ifaz Hussain Assalamu Alaikum Alaikum Salam Mirza Samim Khalil Ahmad Jatao Can I do Facebook? Asman Can I do this? Give me a Do that Amen We'll read the next question. Muhammad Umar from UP India. Is intercourse a prerequisite to Walima? What if due to tiredness or some other reason the act wasn't possible on the first night and the Walima is due tomorrow? Reason to ask this question is if one is not sure of its performance because of zero exposure to the opposite sex, female. As far as intercourse a prerequisite for Walima, there is a misconception amongst many of the Muslims that consummation of the marriage is compulsory before doing Walima. There is no such thing mentioned in the Quran the Hadith that consummation of the marriage is a must before having walima. Yes, there is the hadith of the Prophet that Abla with Prophet when he 
مرد دموات المؤمنين زين ما لا بيتزتها the prophet consummated the marriage and then gave the walima so it is a sunnah to consummate the marriage and then give walima but it is not a fard according to all schools of thought all the four mother you can very well have walima before so there's no problem according to the maliki school of thought there's no problem at all you can have it before what the scholars say that depending upon how the custom is there of that society because different societies in the world have different customs for marriage as long as it doesn't go against the sharia while for in the customs so you can have the walima right from the time after nikah is done till the festive day for the wedding is there so after nikah you can have any time you can have before consummation also after consummation also but the prophet had before consummation of the marriage so so sorry the prophet had after the consummation of the marriage so having walima after the consummation of the marriage is the sunnah it's not a fard at all you can have before you can have later also both accepted and walima is a sunnah it is not a fard secondly consummating the marriage on the first day or the first night of the wedding is not a fard it depends upon the two people who are married depends upon the couple how comfortable they are it can be on the first night it can be second night it can be third night there is no hard fast hard and fast rule in islam that the marriage should be consummated on the first day or the first night or the second day or the second night it depends upon the comfort zone of both the couples and how do they feel and there is no particular compulsory that it should be the first day can be cannot be depending upon the comfort zone of both the parties hope that answers the question the next question Assalamu alaikum Dr Zakir Nain My name is Siraj I am from Perth from Australia I have wanted to become a firefighter and I have to pass nine recruitment procedures to become a firefighter I have been working hard to pass these steps halfway through the recruitment i was a uh, half way through the recruitment i was asked to shave my beard because of safety reasons of wearing an oxygen mask while fighting a fire i don't feel comfortable in shaving my beard for a job because of sunnah i am going through very tough time to make a decision can you please share your thoughts about the situation jazakallah khair the brother asked a question that he was preparing for his exam or the steps to become a firefighter and there are nine steps and midway he was told that you have to shave your beard because it is hygienic and better for wearing oxygen mask when you are a firefighter and he doesn't feel like shaving his beard he wants my advice our beloved prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said it's mentioned in sahih bukhari volume number 7 hadith number 5892 ibn umar may allah please with him, said ibn umar may allah be pleased with him he said that the beloved prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that do the opposite of what the mushrik do trim your mustaches and grow your beard so based on this hadith it is a commandment of the prophet that the muslims should trim their mustaches and grow their beard according to the according to all the four ayma imam abu hanifa according to imam imam malik according to imam shafi as well as imam abd al-jambal it is fard for a muslim 
to keep the beard, it's a command of the Prophet. So based on this but natural, what you're thinking of doing that not to shave your beard for the job, I agree with you. I would advise you that for a job, you should not do something which is haram. If you can avoid doing a small sunnah, no problem, but keeping a beard is not a sunnah, it is a fard. And if someone asks you to shave the beard only for a job, I agree with you, the best is that you should look for another job. Because we as Muslims, we should follow the commandment of Allah and His Rasul. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests us in different situations. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing you. That who do you prefer? Do you love your Prophet more? Or do you love your job more? And the Prophet said, anyone who does not love me more than his father, more than his children, more than anything in this world, he is not a true believer. So, but natural, if there are anything which is further, and if you are asked not to do it, if you are asked to do haram thing for a job, you should have trained from it. My advice to you would be that you look for another job. Inshallah, Allah may give you a job which is more rewarding in this world. Even if you don't get a job which is as paying as the job that you are going to get, Inshallah, in the Akhirah, it will benefit you. It will be your pathway for Jannah. So the best is look for a job which is halal and look for a job in which you will not be asked to do anything which is halal. Hope that's the best. next question. My name is Murad Hayat. I am basically from Pakistan, but now I am living in UK. My question is, I know that everything in the Quran is 100% the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you preach to an atheist that Quran is the word of God and that Quran is revealed 1400 years back, and if the atheist asks the question, what is the proof that Quran is revealed 1,400 years back? What should be the reply? When the atheist asks that what is the proof that the Quran is 1,400 years old, normally in history there are certain requirements to call it a historical fact the rules and regulation. But the rules and regulation for any hadith to be sahih was discussed by me in the last session. And the requirements of a hadith to be sahih is far more stringent than what is the requirement for historical facts. For the Quran, it is much more stringent. So the Quran, for every verse of the Quran to be proved that it's the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is far more stringent. I'll just give you a brief how the Quran was revealed and how it was compiled and how did the Musab that we have today came into existence. We know that the glorious Quran is the last and final revelation that was revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the last and final messenger Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. Now whenever a revelation was revealed to our beloved Prophet Muhammad he used to memorize it and after memorizing it, he used to repeat it to the Sahabas. He had made a committee of the Sahabas who were called as scribes. So whenever he used to repeat it, the Sahabas used to write it down on, on maybe blades of bones, on stones. And the Prophet used to ask them to repeat it. And then he used to hear and he used to rectify if there were any mistake. So the the wahi was revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through Archangel Gabriel to our Prophet. The Prophet memorized it. He, re he repeated it to the Sahabas. The Sahabas wrote it down. He asked the Sahabas to read it again. And he corrected if there were any mistakes. That means it was personally checked by the beloved Prophet. Whatever was written of the Quran was personally checked by a Prophet. And every Ramadan, the Prophet 
used to repeat whatever was revealed to him to Archangel Gabriel. That means the prophet used to counter check with Archangel Gabriel. That means whatever was revealed, whatever he memorized, was it correct or not. And before the prophet died in the last Ramadan, he rehearsed the Quran twice with Archangel Gabriel. So the complete revelation is verbatim from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even the order, though the revelation didn't come in the order that you have today, but the order also was divine. Archangel Gabriel used to inform the Prophet. And finally, in the last Ramadan before the Prophet expired, before his demise, he rehearsed the Quran twice. Verbatim, the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the same order, which was dictated and checked and was written down in different materials. After the Prophet died, six months after his death, there was a battle, there was a war, the battle of Yamama, where about 70 Huffaz were killed. And this troubled Hazrat Umar and Anne and Hazrat Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with them. They were the first and the second Caliph of Islam. At that time, Hazrat Umar may Allah be pleased with him, told Hazrat Umar may Allah be pleased with him that many of the fathers have been killed and if this continues, then these people who know the Quran by heart, we will lose the Quran. So they called one of the Sahaba, that is Zayd bin Thabit, may Allah be pleased with him. They called him and, and Hazrat Abu Bakr may Allah be pleased with him said that you we know are one of the persons who has memorized the Quran best. We know you're honest, we know your memory is good. We know you're truthful. Why don't you make a committee and write down, collect all the material and check it up and write down the Quran and check up in one particular material. The Quran that was written down was in different, different types of material. So there's been Thabit bin Lavi, he was made head of the committee and with other Sahabas they wrote the Quran in one particular homogeneous material and they verified it and they rechecked it and then it was given to Hazrat Abu Bakr Mallah be pleased with him. When he died, it was given to Hazrat Umar Mallah be pleased with him. When Hazrat Umar Mallah be pleased with him died, he gave it to his daughter Hafsa Mallah be pleased with her who was also the wife of the Prophet. And the third Caliph of Islam, Hazrat Usman Mallah be pleased with him. When he realized that there were people reciting the Quran in different dialects. So what he decided that let us copy from the original Musaf, which was checked up by the committee of the scribes at the time of the Prophet. From different materials they collected and they wrote in homogeneous form. This is the authentic verified Quran by the Prophet himself, peace be upon him. So he made copies of it copied from it and sent to different parts of the world, to Mecca, to Medina, to Damascus, in different parts, maybe about six or seven, he made copies and sent to different portions. And the other variant, the people who had their own version, but which were not checked by the Prophet or have different dialects, which were not the authentic seven dialects that were allowed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hadith Usman, may Allah be with him, he burned all the other copies so that it will not be mixed with the original. And this, many of the Sahabas have read what they was right. Not that there were different copies of the Quran, but one was the original checked up by a beloved Prophet and verified again by a team of the scribes, the Sahabas. So, but naturally, the other copy which are not verified may have small mistake, may have many mistakes. So better to burn all the other copies so that there is no mixing of the original authenticated Quran by our beloved Prophet which was again verified by Archangel Gabriel is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And even today, as I mentioned in my last session about hadith, that there are narrators and from that each narrator has to have good memory, to have good character, should see to it that there is a link, there is a continuity and it should not have any hidden faults, it should not contradict with any other known hadith. This Quran is much more stringent than that. Even today the Huffaz can recite the Quran and there are narrations from whom they heard it right going to the Prophet. This stringent method of Quran verification is multiple times more stringent 
than the historical day. Today, in the world, there is no other religious scripture in the world besides the Quran and Sahih Hadith, which have been written with so much accuracy and so much detail. So if you go upon a historical record, the way the Quran was compiled, anyone who has knowledge of historical facts will never doubt that this Quran is correct and this Quran is 14 years old. Now, for a layman who is atheist, may not know how the historical records are checked, whether they are fact or not. The way it is written, even, even William Moore, who was one of the staunchest critics of Islam and Quran, he wrote in his book 200 years back that there is no scripture available on the face of the earth except the Quran, which has maintained its authentic pure form for 12 centuries. He wrote this 200 years back. That means now it is for 14 centuries. But I have got one more way to prove to an atheist easily that the Quran is 1400 years ago. It is 1400 years old. There were manuscripts of the Quran found in Yemen in 1972 on which there was carbon dating done. Carbon dating is a scientific method to know how old the material is. And it is more than 95% accurate. When carbon dating was done on these fragments of Quran found in Yemen in 1972, it said it is from the 7th century, about somewhere close to 650 CE. But the latest carbon dating done in Birmingham on two fragments of the Quran, which were from chapter number 18 to chapter number 20, that is Surah Kahaf, Surah Maryam and Surah Taha. This was there in the Birmingham University from 1935. And carbon dating was done in 2015, about five years back. And the result came that these manuscripts of the Quran are dated between 568 C to 645 C. And this carbon dating is 95% accurate. And we know that the Quran was revealed between 610 and 632 C. This frame given by the carbon dating from 568 C to 645 C falls between this range. And we know the Quran was revealed 610 to 632 C. Even these copies that were written and copied by Hazrat Usman, may Allah be pleased with him, and sent to different parts of the world, two copies yet are there. One is in Tashkent in Uzbekistan, and the other is in the Koptaki Museum in Istanbul in Turkey. This is a complete musaf. And today, even if you do carbon dating on that, it will easily be proved that this is about 49 years old. So, there is no other manuscript available like the Quran with so much accuracy. And if you compare that what's available in Tashkent or available in Istanbul, if you compare to the present copy, it is verbatim same. At that time, there were no harkat, but the Arabic letters are the same. So that will confirm that this is the same Quran, what is there in the museum available. If you do carbon dating, which has been done with the fragments of the copies available in Birmingham, it dates back about 14 years ago. So to an atheist, you tell him this is scientific proof that the Quran is 1400 years old. So when we talk about what scientific fact mentioned in the Quran, what we have come to know today, 50 years back, 100 years back, Allah said 14 years ago, this will surely convince to an atheist that this Quran has to be the word of Allah.